Buddhism, U.S. also, is the world's fourth largest religion with over 520 million followers, or over 7% of the global population, known as Buddhists. An Indian religion, Buddhism encompasses a variety of traditions, beliefs and spiritual practices largely based on original teachings attributed to the Buddha and resulting interpreted philosophies. Buddhism originated in ancient India as a sramana tradition sometime between the 6th and 4th centuries BCE, spreading through much of Asia. Two major extant branches of Buddhism are generally recognized by scholars, Theravada Pali, the school of the elders, and Mahayana Sanskrit, the great vehicle. All Buddhist traditions share the goal of overcoming suffering and the cycle of death and rebirth, either by the attainment of nirvana or through the path of Buddhahood. Buddhist schools vary in their interpretation of the path to liberation, the relative importance and canonicity assigned to the various Buddhist texts, and their specific teachings and practices. Widely observed practices include taking refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha, observance of moral precepts, monasticism, meditation, and the cultivation of the paramitas virtues. Theravada Buddhism has a widespread following in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia. Mahayana, which includes the traditions of Pure Land, Zen, Nichiren Buddhism, Shingon and Tiantai is found throughout East Asia. Vajrayana, a body of teachings attributed to Indian adepts, may be viewed as a separate branch or as an aspect of Mahayana Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism, which preserves the Vajrayana teachings of 8th century India, is practiced in the countries of the Himalayan region, Mongolia, and Kalmykia. Life of the Buddha Buddhism is an Indian religion attributed to the teachings of the Buddha, supposedly born Siddhartha Gautama, and also known as the Tathagata thus gone, and Sakamuni sage of the Sakyas". Early texts have his personal name as Gautama or Gautama Pali without any mention of Siddhartha achieved the goal which appears to have been a kind of honorific title when it does appear. The details of Buddha's life are mentioned in many early Buddhist texts but are inconsistent, and his social background and life details are difficult to prove, the precise dates uncertain. The evidence of the early texts suggests that he was born as Siddhartha Gautama in Lumbini and grew up in Kapilavastu, a town in the plains region of the modern Nepal-India border, and that he spent his life in what is now modern Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. Some hagiographic legends state that his father was a king named Sadodana, his mother was Queen Maya, and he was born in Lumbini Gardens. However, scholars such as Richard Gombrich consider this a dubious claim because a combination of evidence suggests he was born in the Shakya's community, one that later gave him the title Shakyamuni, and the Shakya community was governed by a small oligarchy or republic-like council where there were no ranks but where seniority mattered instead. Some of the stories about Buddha, his life, his teachings, and claims about the society he grew up in may have been invented and interpolated at a later time into the Buddhist texts. According to the Buddhist sutras, Gautama was moved by the innate suffering of humanity and its endless repetition due to rebirth. He set out on a quest to end this repeated suffering. Early Buddhist canonical texts and early biographies of Gautama state that Gautama first studied under Vedic teachers, namely Alara Kalama Sanskrit, Arata Kalama and Yudhika Ramaputta Sanskrit, Yudraka Ramaputra, learning meditation and ancient philosophies, particularly the concept of nothingness, emptiness, from the former, and what is neither seen nor unseen, from the latter, finding these teachings to be insufficient to attain his goal, he turned to the practice of asceticism. This too fell short of attaining his goal, and then he turned to the practice of dhyana, meditation, which he had already discovered in his youth. He famously sat in meditation under a ficus religiosa tree now called the Bodhi tree in the town of Bodh Gaya in the Gangetic Plains region of South Asia. He gained insight into the workings of karma and his former lives, and attained enlightenment, certainty about the middle way SKT, Madhyama Pratipad as the right path of spiritual practice to end suffering dukkha from rebirths in samsara. As a fully enlightened Buddha SKT, Samyaksambuddha, he attracted followers and founded a Sangha monastic order. 
Now, as the Buddha, he spent the rest of his life teaching the Dharma he had discovered, and died at the age of 80 in Kushinagar, India. Buddha's teachings were propagated by his followers, which in the last centuries of the first millennium BCE became over 18 Buddhist sub schools of thought, each with its own basket of texts containing different interpretations and authentic teachings of the Buddha. These over time evolved into many traditions, of which the more well known and widespread in the modern era are Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana Buddhism. The problems of life, dukkha and samsara <laughs> Four Noble Truths, Dukkha and its Ending The Four Truths express the basic orientation of Buddhism, we crave and cling to impermanent states and things, which is dukkha, incapable of satisfying, and painful. This keeps us caught in samsara, the endless cycle of repeated rebirth, dukkha and dying again. But there is a way to liberation from this endless cycle to the state of nirvana, namely following the Noble Eightfold Path. The truth of dukkha is the basic insight that life in this mundane world, with its clinging and craving to impermanent states and things is dukkha, and unsatisfactory. Dukkha can be translated as, incapable of satisfying. The unsatisfactory nature and the general insecurity of all conditioned phenomena, or painful, dukkha is most commonly translated as suffering, but this is inaccurate, since it refers not to episodic suffering, but to the intrinsically unsatisfactory nature of temporary states and things, including pleasant but temporary experiences. We expect happiness from states and things which are impermanent, and therefore cannot attain real happiness. In Buddhism, dukkha is one of the three marks of existence, along with impermanence and anatta non-self. Buddhism, like other major Indian religions, asserts that everything is impermanent anicca, but, unlike them, also asserts that there is no permanent self or soul in living beings anatta. The ignorance or misperception avia that anything is permanent or that there is self in any being is considered a wrong understanding, and the primary source of clinging and dukkha, dukkha arises when we crave pali, tana, and cling to these changing phenomena. The clinging and craving produces karma, which ties us to samsara, the round of death and rebirth. Craving includes kama tana, craving for sense pleasures, bhavatana, craving to continue the cycle of life and death, including rebirth, and vibhavatana, craving to not experience the world and painful feelings, dukkha ceases, or can be confined, when craving and clinging cease or are confined. This also means that no more karma is being produced, and rebirth ends. Cessation is nirvana, blowing out and peace of mind, by following the Buddhist path to moksha, liberation, one starts to disengage from craving and clinging to impermanent states and things. The term, path, is usually taken to mean the Noble Eightfold Path, but other versions of, the path, can also be found in the Nikayas. The Theravada tradition regards insight into the Four Truths as liberating in itself. The cycle of rebirth Topic. Samsara Samsara means wandering or world with the connotation of cyclic, circuitous change. It refers to the theory of rebirth and cyclicality of all life, matter, existence. A fundamental assumption of Buddhism, as with all major Indian religions. Samsara in Buddhism is considered to be dukkha, unsatisfactory and painful, perpetuated by desire and avidya ignorance, and the resulting karma, the theory of rebirths, and realms in which these rebirths can occur, is extensively developed in Buddhism, in particular Tibetan Buddhism with its wheel of existence doctrine. Liberation from this cycle of existence, nirvana, has been the foundation and the most important historical justification of Buddhism. The later Buddhist texts assert that rebirth can occur in six realms of existence, namely three good realms, heavenly, demigod, human, and three evil realms, animal, hungry ghosts, hellish. Samsara ends if a person attains nirvana, the blowing out of the desires and the gaining of true insight into impermanence and non-self reality. Rebirth 
Rebirth refers to a process whereby beings go through a succession of lifetimes as one of many possible forms of sentient life, each running from conception to death. In Buddhist thought, this rebirth does not involve any soul, because of its doctrine of anatta Sanskrit, anatman, no self doctrine, which rejects the concepts of a permanent self or an unchanging, eternal soul, as it is called in Hinduism and Christianity. According to Buddhism there ultimately is no such thing as a self in any being or any essence in anything. The Buddhist traditions have traditionally disagreed on what it is in a person that is reborn, as well as how quickly the rebirth occurs after each death. Some Buddhist traditions assert that no self doctrine means that there is no perduring self, but there is avasya inexpressible self which migrates from one life to another. The majority of Buddhist traditions, in contrast, assert that vijnana a person's consciousness though evolving, exists as a continuum and as the mechanistic basis of what undergoes rebirth, rebecoming and redeath. The rebirth depends on the merit or demerit gained by one's karma, as well as that accrued on one's behalf by a family member. Each rebirth takes place within one of five realms according to Theravadins, or six according to other schools heavenly, demi gods, humans, animals, hungry ghosts, and hellish. In East Asian and Tibetan Buddhism, rebirth is not instantaneous, and there is an intermediate state Tibetan, bardo, between one life and the next. The orthodox Theravada position rejects the weight, and asserts that rebirth of a being is immediate. However there are passages in the Samyutta Nikaya of the Pali Canon that seem to lend support to the idea that the Buddha taught about an intermediate stage between one life and the next. <laughs> karma In Buddhism, karma from Sanskrit, action, work drives samsara, the endless cycle of suffering and rebirth for each being. Good, skillful deeds Pali, kusala, and bad, unskillful deeds Pali, akusala, produce seeds in the unconscious receptacle alaya that mature later either in this life or in a subsequent rebirth. The existence of karma is a core belief in Buddhism, as with all major Indian religions, it implies neither fatalism nor that everything that happens to a person is caused by karma. A central aspect of Buddhist theory of karma is that intent setana matters and is essential to bring about a consequence or phala fruit, or vipaka result. However, good or bad karma accumulates even if there is no physical action, and just having ill or good thoughts create karmic seeds, thus, actions of body, speech or mind all lead to karmic seeds. In the Buddhist traditions, life aspects affected by the law of karma in past and current births of a being include the form of rebirth, realm of rebirth, social class, character and major circumstances of a lifetime. It operates like the laws of physics, without external intervention, on every being in all six realms of existence including human beings and gods. A notable aspect of the karma theory in Buddhism is merit transfer. A person accumulates merit not only through intentions and ethical living, but also is able to gain merit from others by exchanging goods and services, such as through dana charity to monks or nuns. Further, a person can transfer one's own good karma to living family members and ancestors. Liberation The cessation of the kleshas and the attainment of nirvana nibbana, with which the cycle of rebirth ends, has been the primary and the soteriological goal of the Buddhist path for monastic life since the time of the Buddha. The term, path, is usually taken to mean the Noble Eightfold Path, but other versions of, the path, can also be found in the Nikayas. In some passages in the Pali Canon, a distinction is being made between right knowledge or insight and right liberation or release as the means to attain cessation and liberation. Nirvana literally means, blowing out, quenching, becoming extinguished. In early Buddhist texts, it is the state of restraint and self control that leads to the blowing out and the ending of the cycles of sufferings associated with rebirths and redeaths. Many later Buddhist texts describe nirvana as identical with anatta with complete emptiness, nothingness. 
In some texts, the state is described with greater detail, such as passing through the gate of emptiness sunyata, realizing that there is no soul or self in any living being, then passing through the gate of signlessness animita, realizing that nirvana cannot be perceived, and finally passing through the gate of wishlessness apranahita, realizing that nirvana is the state of not even wishing for nirvana. The nirvana state has been described in Buddhist texts partly in a manner similar to other Indian religions, as the state of complete liberation, enlightenment, highest happiness happiness, bliss, fearlessness, freedom, permanence, non-dependent origination, unfathomable, and indescribable. It has also been described in part differently, as a state of spiritual release marked by emptiness and realization of non-self. While Buddhism considers the liberation from samsara as the ultimate spiritual goal, in traditional practice, the primary focus of a vast majority of lay Buddhists has been to seek and accumulate merit through good deeds, donations to monks and various Buddhist rituals in order to gain better rebirths rather than nirvana. Topic: The path to liberation, bhavana, practice, cultivation. While the Noble Eightfold Path is best known in the West, a wide variety of practices and stages have been used and described in the Buddhist traditions. Basic practices include sila ethics, samadhi meditation, dhyana and prajna wisdom, as described in the Noble Eightfold Path. An important additional practice is a kind and compassionate attitude toward every living being and the world. Devotion is also important in some Buddhist traditions, and in the Tibetan traditions visualizations of deities and mandalas are important. The value of textual study is regarded differently in the various Buddhist traditions. It is central to Theravada and highly important to Tibetan Buddhism, while the Zen tradition takes an ambiguous stance. Refuge in the Three Jewels Traditionally, the first step in most Buddhist schools requires taking three refuges, also called the Three Jewels Sanskrit, Triratna, Pali, Tiratana as the foundation of one's religious practice. Pali texts employ the Brahmanical motif of the Triple Refuge, found in the Rigveda 9.97.47, Rigveda 6.46.9 and Chandogya Upanishad 2.22.3-4. Tibetan Buddhism sometimes adds a fourth refuge, in the Lama. The three refuges are believed by Buddhists to be protective and a form of reverence. The three jewels are the Gautama Buddha, the historical Buddha, the Blessed One, the awakened with true knowledge, the Dharma, the precepts, the practice, the four truths, the eightfold path, the Sangha, order of monks, the community of Buddha's disciples. Reciting the three refuges is considered in Buddhism not as a place to hide, rather, a thought that purifies, uplifts, and strengthens. The Buddhist path <laughs> Theravada, Noble Eightfold Path An important guiding principle of Buddhist practice is the Middle Way It was a part of Buddha's first sermon, where he presented the Noble Eightfold Path that was a middle way between the extremes of asceticism and hedonistic sense pleasures. In Buddhism, states Harvey, the doctrine of dependent arising, conditioned arising, pratityasamutpada to explain rebirth is viewed as the middle way between the doctrines that a being has a permanent soul involved in rebirth eternalism and death is final and there is no rebirth. Annihilationism, in the Theravada canon, the Pali suttas, various often irreconcilable sequences can be found. According to Carol Anderson, the Theravada canon lacks an overriding and comprehensive structure of the path to nibbana. Nevertheless, the Noble Eightfold Path, or Eightfold Path of the Noble Ones, has become an important description of the Buddhist path. It consists of a set of eight interconnected factors or conditions, that when developed together, lead to the cessation of dukkha. These eight factors are, right view or right understanding, right intention or right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This eightfold path is the fourth of the four noble truths, and asserts the path to the cessation of dukkha suffering, pain, unsatisfactoriness. The path teaches that the way of the enlightened ones stopped their craving, clinging and karmic accumulations, and thus ended their endless cycles of rebirth and suffering. 
The Noble Eightfold Path is grouped into three basic divisions, as follows. Topic: <laughs> Mahayana Bodhisattva Path and the Six Paramitas. Mahayana Buddhism is based principally upon the path of a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva refers to one who is on the path to Buddhahood. The term Mahayana was originally a synonym for bodhisattvayana or bodhisattva vehicle. In the earliest texts of Mahayana Buddhism, the path of a bodhisattva was to awaken the bodhicitta. Between the 1st and 3rd century CE, this tradition introduced the Ten Bhumi doctrine, which means ten levels or stages of awakening. This development was followed by the acceptance that it is impossible to achieve Buddhahood in one current lifetime, and the best goal is not nirvana for oneself, but Buddhahood after climbing through the ten levels during multiple rebirths. Mahayana scholars then outlined an elaborate path, for monks and laypeople, and the path includes the vow to help teach Buddhist knowledge to other beings, so as to help them cross samsara and liberate themselves, once one reaches the Buddhahood in a future rebirth. One part of this path are the paramita perfections, to cross over, derived from the Jataka's tales of Buddha's numerous rebirths. The Mahayana texts are inconsistent in their discussion of the paramitas, and some texts include lists of two, others four, six, ten and fifty-two. The six paramitas have been most studied, and these are Dana paramita, perfection of giving, primarily to monks, nuns and the Buddhist monastic establishment dependent on the alms and gifts of the lay householders, in return for generating religious merit. Some texts recommend ritually transferring the merit so accumulated for better rebirth to someone else. Sila Paramita, perfection of morality, it outlines ethical behavior for both the laity and the Mahayana monastic community. This list is similar to Sila in the Eightfold Path, i.e., right speech, right action, right livelihood. Kasanti Paramita, perfection of patience, willingness to endure hardship Virya Paramita, perfection of vigor, this is similar to right effort in the Eightfold Path Dhyana Paramita, perfection of meditation, this is similar to right concentration in the Eightfold Path Prajna Paramita, perfection of insight wisdom, awakening to the characteristics of existence such as karma, rebirths, impermanence, no self, dependent origination and emptiness, this is complete acceptance of the Buddha teaching, then conviction, followed by ultimate realization that dharmas are non-arising. In Mahayana sutras that include ten paramitas, the additional four perfections are skillful means, vow, power and knowledge. The most discussed paramita and the highest rated perfection in Mahayana texts is the Prajna Paramita, or the Perfection of Insight. This insight in the Mahayana tradition, states Shohei Ichimura, has been the insight of non-duality or the absence of reality in all things. <laughs> Sila, Buddhist ethics Sila Sanskrit or Sila Pali is the concept of moral virtues that is the second group and an integral part of the noble eightfold path it consists of right speech right action and right livelihood sila appear as ethical precepts for both lay and ordained buddhist devotees it includes the five precepts for lay people eight or 10 precepts for monastic life as well as rules of dhamma vinaya or padamaka adopted by a monastery Topic. Precepts Buddhist scriptures explain the five precepts Pali, Pankasila, Sanskrit, Pankasila, as the minimal standard of Buddhist morality. It is the most important system of morality in Buddhism, together with the monastic rules. The five precepts apply to both male and female devotees, and these are Abstain from killing ahimsa. Abstain from stealing Abstain from sensual including sexual misconduct. Abstain from lying. Abstain from intoxicants. Undertaking and upholding the five precepts is based on the principle of non-harming Pali and Sanskrit, ahimsa. The Pali canon recommends one to compare oneself with others, and on the basis of that, not to hurt others. Compassion and a belief in karmic retribution form the foundation of the precepts. Undertaking the five precepts as part of regular lay devotional practice, both at home and at the local temple. However, the extent to which people keep them differs per region and time. 
They are sometimes referred to as the Sravakayana precepts in the Mahayana tradition, contrasting them with the Bodhisattva precepts. The five precepts are not commandments and transgressions do not invite religious sanctions, but their power has been based on the Buddhist belief in karmic consequences and their impact in the afterlife. Killing in Buddhist belief leads to rebirth in the hell realms, and for a longer time in more severe conditions if the murder victim was a monk. Adultery, similarly, invites a rebirth as prostitute or in hell, depending on whether the partner was unmarried or married. These moral precepts have been voluntarily self-enforced in lay Buddhist culture through the associated belief in karma and rebirth. Within the Buddhist doctrine, the precepts are meant to develop mind and character to make progress on the path to enlightenment. The monastic life in Buddhism has additional precepts as part of Padamaka, and unlike lay people, transgressions by monks do invite sanctions. Full expulsion from Sangha follows any instance of killing, engaging in sexual intercourse, theft or false claims about one's knowledge. Temporary expulsion follows a lesser offense. The sanctions vary per monastic fraternity Nikaya. .Lay people and novices in many Buddhist fraternities also uphold eight or ten from time to time. Four of these are same as for the lay devotee, no killing, no stealing, no lying, and no intoxicants. The other four precepts are no sexual activity abstain from eating at the wrong time e.g. only eat solid food before noon abstain from jewelry perfume adornment entertainment abstain from sleeping on high beds this states indologist richard gombrich means to sleep on a mat on the ground all eight precepts are sometimes observed by lay people on aposatha days full moon new moon the first and last quarter following the lunar calendar the ten precepts also include to abstain from accepting money. In addition to these precepts, Buddhist monasteries have hundreds of rules of conduct, which are a part of its padamaka. Topic: <laughs> Vinaya. Vinaya is the specific code of conduct for a sangha of monks or nuns. It includes the Padamaka, a set of 227 offences including 75 rules of decorum for monks, along with penalties for transgression, in the Theravadan tradition. The precise content of the Vinaya Pitaka scriptures on the Vinaya differs in different schools and tradition, and different monasteries set their own standards on its implementation. The list of Padamaka is recited every fortnight in a ritual gathering of all monks. Buddhist text with Vinaya rules for monasteries have been traced in all Buddhist traditions, with the oldest surviving being the ancient Chinese translations. Monastic communities in the Buddhist tradition cut normal social ties to family and community, and live as islands unto themselves. Within a monastic fraternity, a Sangha has its own rules. A monk abides by these institutionalized rules, and living life as the Vinaya prescribes it is not merely a means, but very nearly the end in itself. Transgressions by a monk on Sangha Vinaya rules invites enforcement, which can include temporary or permanent expulsion. Samadhi meditation A wide range of meditation practices has developed in the Buddhist traditions, but meditation primarily refers to the practice of dhyana c. q. jhana. It is a practice in which the attention of the mind is first narrowed to the focus on one specific object, such as the breath, a concrete object, or a specific thought, mental image or mantra. After this initial focusing of the mind, the focus is coupled to mindfulness, maintaining a calm mind while being aware of one's surroundings. The practice of dhyana aids in maintaining a calm mind, and avoiding disturbance of this calm mind by mindfulness of disturbing thoughts and feelings. Origins The earliest evidence of yogis and their meditative tradition, states Carol Werner, is found in the Kesson hymn 10.136 of the Rigveda. While evidence suggests meditation was practiced in the centuries preceding the Buddha, the meditative methodologies described in the Buddhist texts are some of the earliest among texts that have survived into the modern era. These methodologies likely incorporate what existed before the Buddha as well as those first developed within Buddhism. According to Bronckhorst, the Four Dhyanas was a Buddhist invention. Bronckhorst notes that the Buddhist canon has a mass of contradictory statements, little is known about their relative chronology, and 
There can be no doubt that the canon, including the older parts, the Sutra and Vinaya Pitaka, was composed over a long period of time. Meditative practices were incorporated from other shramanic movements. The Buddhist texts describe how Buddha learnt the practice of the formless dhyana from Brahmanical practices, in the Nikayas ascribed to Alara Kalama and Yudhika Ramaputta. The Buddhist canon also describes and criticizes alternative dhyana practices, which likely mean the pre existing mainstream meditation practices of Jainism and Hinduism. Buddha added a new focus and interpretation, particularly through the Four Dhyanas methodology, in which mindfulness is maintained. Further, the focus of meditation and the underlying theory of liberation guiding the meditation has been different in Buddhism. For example, states Bronckhorst, the verse 4.4.23 of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad with its "...become calm, subdued, quiet, patiently enduring, concentrated, one sees soul in oneself," is most probably a meditative state. The Buddhist discussion of meditation is without the concept of soul and the discussion criticizes both the ascetic meditation of Jainism and the "...real self, soul," meditation of Hinduism. Topic. Four Rupa Jhana and Four Arupa Jhana For Nirvana, Buddhist texts teach various meditation methodologies, of which Rupa Jhana four meditations in the realm of form and Arupa Jhana four meditations in the formless realm have been the most studied. These are described in the Pali Canon as trance-like states in the world of desirelessness. The four dhyanas under Rupa Jhanas are First dhyana, detach from all sensory desires and sinful states that are a source of unwholesome karma. Success here is described in Buddhist texts as leading to discursive thinking, deliberation, detachment, sukha pleasure, and pretty rapture. Second dhyana, cease deliberation and all discursive thoughts. Success leads to one-pointed thinking, serenity, pleasure and rapture. Third dhyana, lose feeling of rapture. Success leads to equanimity, mindfulness and pleasure, without rapture. Fourth dhyana, cease all effects, lose all happiness and sadness. Success in the fourth meditation stage leads to pure equanimity and mindfulness, without any pleasure or pain. The arupa jhanas formless realm meditation are also four, which are entered by those who have mastered the rupa jhanas arhats. The first formless dhyana gets to infinite space without form or color or shape, the second to infinity of perception base of the infinite space, the third formless dhyana transcends object-subject perception base, while the fourth is where he dwells in nothing at all where there are no feelings, no ideas, nor are there non-ideas, unto total cessation. The four rupa dhyanas in Buddhist practice lead to rebirth in successfully better rupa Brahma heavenly realms, while arupa dhyanas lead into arupa heavens. Richard Gombrich notes that the sequence of the four rupa jhanas describes two different cognitive states. The first two describe a narrowing of attention, while in the third and fourth jhana attention is expanded again. Alexander Wynne further explains that the dhyana scheme is poorly understood. According to Wynne, words expressing the inculcation of awareness, such as sati, sampahano, and upekka, are mistranslated or understood as particular factors of meditative states, whereas they refer to a particular way of perceiving the sense objects. <laughs> <laughs> Meditation and insight the Buddhist tradition has incorporated two traditions regarding the use of dhyana meditation, Pali jhana. There is a tradition that stresses attaining prajna insight, bodhi, kensho, vipassana as the means to awakening and liberation. But it has also incorporated the yogic tradition, as reflected in the use of jhana, which is rejected in other sutras as not resulting in the final result of liberation. Lambert Schmidhausen, a professor of Buddhist studies, discerns three possible roads to liberation as described in the suttas, to which Vedder adds the sole practice of dhyana itself. According to Vedder and Bronckhorst, the earliest Buddhist path consisted of a set of practices which culminate in the practice of dhyana, leading to a calm of mind which according to Vedder is the liberation which is being sought. Frau Wallner notes that the Buddha regarded tana, thirst, craving, to be the cause of suffering, not ignorance. But this was in contradiction to the Indian traditions of the time, and posed a problem, which was then also incorporated into the Buddhist teachings. Later on, liberating insight came to be regarded as equally liberating. This liberating insight came to be exemplified by prajna, or the insight in the four truths, 
but also by other elements of the Buddhist teachings. Topic: The Brahma Vihara. The four immeasurables or four abodes, also called Brahma Viharas, are virtues or directions for meditation in Buddhist traditions, which helps a person be reborn in the heavenly Brahma realm. These are traditionally believed to be a characteristic of the deity Brahma and the heavenly abode he resides in. The four Brahma Vihara are Loving kindness Pali, Metta, Sanskrit, Maitri is active goodwill towards all. Compassion Pali and Sanskrit, Karuna results from Metta, it is identifying the suffering of others as one's own. Empathetic joy Pali and Sanskrit, Mudita, is the feeling of joy because others are happy, even if one did not contribute to it, it is a form of sympathetic joy. Equanimity Pali, Upeka, Sanskrit, Upeksa, is even-mindedness and serenity, treating everyone impartially. According to Peter Harvey, the Buddhist scriptures acknowledge that the four Brahmavihara meditation practices did not originate within the Buddhist tradition. The Brahmavihara sometimes as Brahmaloka, along with the tradition of meditation and the above four immeasurables are found in pre-Buddha and post-Buddha Vedic and Shramanic literature. Aspects of the Brahmavihara practice for rebirths into the heavenly realm have been an important part of Buddhist meditation tradition. According to Gombrich, the Buddhist usage of the Brahma Vihara originally referred to an awakened state of mind, and a concrete attitude toward other beings which was equal to living with Brahman here and now. The later tradition took those descriptions too literally, linking them to cosmology and understanding them as living with Brahman by rebirth in the Brahma world. According to Gombrich, the Buddha taught that kindness, what Christians tend to call love, was a way to salvation. <laughs> Visualizations, deities, mandalas Idols of deity and icons have been a part of the historic practice, and in Buddhist texts such as the 11th century Sadhanamala, a devotee visualizes and identifies himself or herself with the imagined deity as part of meditation. This has been particularly popular in Vajrayana meditative traditions, but also found in Mahayana and Theravada traditions, particularly in temples and with Buddha images. In Tibetan Buddhism tradition, mandala are mystical maps for the visualization process with cosmic symbolism. There are numerous deities, each with a mandala, and they are used during initiation ceremonies and meditation. The mandalas are concentric geometric shapes symbolizing layers of the external world, gates and sacred space. The meditation deity is in the center, sometimes surrounded by protective gods and goddesses. Visualizations with deities and mandalas in Buddhism is a tradition traceable to ancient times, and likely well established by the time the 5th century text Visuddhimagga was composed. Practice, monks, laity According to Peter Harvey, whenever Buddhism has been healthy, not only ordained but also more committed lay people have practiced formal meditation. Loud devotional chanting however, adds Harvey, has been the most prevalent Buddhist practice and considered a form of meditation that produces energy, joy, loving kindness and calm purifies mind and benefits the chanter throughout most of buddhist history meditation has been primarily practiced in buddhist monastic tradition and historical evidence suggests that serious meditation by lay people has been an exception in recent history sustained meditation has been pursued by a minority of monks in buddhist monasteries western interest in meditation has led to a revival where ancient buddhist ideas and precepts are adapted to western mores and interpreted liberally presenting buddhism as a meditation based form of spirituality topic <laughs> prajna insight prajna sanskrit or panya pali is insight or knowledge of the true nature of existence the Buddhist tradition regards ignorance avidya, a fundamental ignorance, misunderstanding or misperception of the nature of reality, as one of the basic causes of dukkha and samsara. By overcoming ignorance or misunderstanding one is enlightened and liberated. This overcoming includes awakening to impermanence and the non-self nature of reality, and this develops dispassion for the objects of clinging, and liberates a being from dukkha and samsara. 
Prajna is important in all Buddhist traditions, and is the wisdom about the dharmas, functioning of karma and rebirths, realms of samsara, impermanence of everything, no self in anyone or anything, and dependent origination. Origins The origins of «liberating insight» are unclear. Buddhist texts, states Bronckhorst, do not describe it explicitly, and the content of «liberating insight» is likely not original to Buddhism. According to Vedder and Bronckhorst, this growing importance of «liberating insight» was a response to other religious groups in India, which held that a liberating insight was indispensable for moksha, liberation from rebirth. Bronckhorst suggests that the conception of what exactly constituted liberating insight for Buddhists developed over time. Whereas originally it may not have been specified as an insight, later on the Four Noble Truths served as such, to be superseded by Pratityasamutpada, and still later, in the Hinayana schools, by the doctrine of the non existence of a substantial self or person. Other descriptions of this liberating insight exist in the Buddhist canon, that the five skandhas are impermanent, disagreeable, and neither the self nor belonging to oneself. The contemplation of the arising and disappearance of the five skandhas. The realization of the skandhas is empty vain, and without any pith or substance In the Pali canon liberating insight is attained in the fourth dhyana. However, states Vedder, modern scholarship on the Pali Canon has uncovered a whole series of inconsistencies in the transmission of the Buddha's word, and there are many conflicting versions of what constitutes higher knowledge and samadhi that leads to the liberation from rebirth and suffering. Even within the four dhyana methodology of meditation, Vedder notes that penetrating abstract truths and penetrating them successively does not seem possible in a state of mind which is without contemplation and reflection. According to Vedder, dhyana itself constituted the original, liberating practice. Carol Anderson notes that insight is often depicted in the Vinaya as the opening of the Dhamma eye, which sets one on the Buddhist path to liberation. Theravada Vipassana in Theravada Buddhism, but also in Tibetan Buddhism, two types of meditation Buddhist practices are being followed, namely samatha Pali, Sanskrit, samatha, calm, and vipassana insight. Samatha is also called calming meditation, and was adopted into Buddhism from pre-Buddha Indian traditions. Vipassana meditation was added by Buddha, and refers to insight meditation. Vipassana does not aim at peace and tranquility, states Damien Keown, but the generation of penetrating and critical insight panna. The focus of vipassana meditation is to continuously and thoroughly know impermanence of everything anicca, no self in anything anatta, and the dukkha teachings of Buddhism. Contemporary Theravada orthodoxy regards samatha as a preparation for vipassana, pacifying the mind and strengthening the concentration in order to allow the work of insight, which leads to liberation. In contrast, the vipassana movement argues that insight levels can be discerned without the need for developing samatha further due to the risks of going out of the course when strong samatha is developed. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Dependent arising. Pratityasamutpada, also called dependent arising or dependent origination is the Buddhist theory to explain the nature and relations of being, becoming, existence and ultimate reality. Buddhism asserts that there is nothing independent, except the state of nirvana. All physical and mental states depend on and arise from other pre-existing states, and in turn from them arise other dependent states while they cease. The dependent arisings have a causal conditioning, and thus Pratityasamutpada is the Buddhist belief that causality is the basis of ontology, not a creator god nor the ontological Vedic concept called universal self Brahman, nor any other transcendent creative principle. However, the Buddhist thought does not understand causality in terms of Newtonian mechanics, rather it understands it as conditioned arising. 
In Buddhism, dependent arising is referring to conditions created by a plurality of causes that necessarily co-originate a phenomenon within and across lifetimes, such as karma in one life creating conditions that lead to rebirth in one of the realms of existence for another lifetime. Buddhism applies the dependent arising theory to explain origination of endless cycles of dukkha and rebirth through its 12 nidanas or 12 links doctrine. It states that because avidya ignorance exists samskaras karmic formations exists, because samskaras exists therefore vijnana consciousness exists, and in a similar manner it links namarupa sentient body, sadayatana six senses, sparsa sensory stimulation, vedana feeling, tana craving, upadana grasping, bhava becoming, jati birth, and jaramarana old age, death, sorrow, pain. By breaking the circuitous links of the twelve nidanas, Buddhism asserts that liberation from these endless cycles cycles of rebirth and dukkha can be attained. Mahayana Emptiness Sunyata, or emptiness, is a central concept in Nagarjuna's Madhyamaka school, and widely attested in the Prajnaparamita Sutras. It brings together key Buddhist doctrines, particularly anatta and dependent origination, to refute the metaphysics of Sarvastivada and Satrantika extinct non-Mahayana schools. Not only sentient beings are empty of Atman, all phenomena dharmas are without any svabhava literally, own nature, or self-nature, and thus without any underlying essence, and empty. A being independent, thus the heterodox theories of svabhava circulating at the time were refuted on the basis of the doctrines of early Buddhism. Topic: <inaudible> Representation only c q mind only. Sarvastivada teachings, which were criticized by Nagarjuna, were reformulated by scholars such as Vasubandhu and Asanga and were adapted into the Yogacara school. One of the main features of Yogacara philosophy is the concept of Vijñapti Matra. It is often used interchangeably with the term Sita Matra, but they have different meanings. The standard translation of both terms is, "...consciousness only", or "...mind only". Several modern researchers object to this translation, and the accompanying label of "...absolute idealism", or "...idealistic monism". A better translation for vijñapti matra is representation only, while an alternative translation for sita mind, thought, matra only, exclusively, has not been proposed. While the Madhyamaka school held that asserting the existence or non-existence of any ultimately real thing was inappropriate, some later exponents of Yogacara asserted that the mind and only the mind is ultimately real a doctrine known as chittamatra. Vasubandhu and Asanga, however, did not assert that mind was truly existent, or the basis of all reality. These two schools of thought, in opposition or synthesis, form the basis of subsequent Mahayana metaphysics in the Indo Tibetan tradition. <inaudible> <inaudible> Buddha nature Buddha nature is a concept found in some first millennium CE Buddhist texts, such as the Tathagatagarbha Sutras. This concept has been controversial in Buddhism, but has a following in East Asian Buddhism. These sutras suggest, states Paul Williams, that all sentient beings contain a Tathagata as their essence, core inner nature, self. The Tathagatagarbha doctrine, at its earliest probably appeared about the later part of the 3rd century CE, and it contradicts the Anatta doctrine in a vast majority of Buddhist texts, leading scholars to posit that the Tathagatagarbha sutras were written to promote Buddhism to non-Buddhists. However, the Buddhist text Ritnagatravabhaga states that the self implied in Tathagatagarbha doctrine is actually not self. Devotion Devotion is an important part of the practice of most Buddhists. Devotional practices include ritual prayer, prostration, offerings, pilgrimage, and chanting. In Pure Land Buddhism, devotion to the Buddha Amitabha is the main practice. In Nichiren Buddhism, devotion to the Lotus Sutra is the main practice. Bhakti called body in Pali has been a common practice in Theravada Buddhism, where offerings and group prayers are made to deities and particularly images of Buddha. 
According to Carol Werner and other scholars, devotional worship has been a significant practice in Theravada Buddhism, and deep devotion is part of Buddhist traditions starting from the earliest days. Guru devotion is a central practice of Tibetan Buddhism. The guru is considered essential, and to the Buddhist devotee, the guru is the enlightened teacher and ritual master. In Vajrayana spiritual pursuits, for someone seeking Buddhahood, the Guru is the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, wrote the 12th century Buddhist scholar Sadhanamala. The veneration of an obedience to teachers is also important in Theravada and Zen Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> Buddhist texts Buddhism, like all Indian religions, was an oral tradition in ancient times. The Buddha's words, the early doctrines and concepts, and the interpretations were transmitted from one generation to the next by the word of mouth in monasteries, and not through written texts. The first Buddhist canonical texts were likely written down in Sri Lanka, about 400 years after the Buddha died. The texts were part of the Tripitakas, and many versions appeared thereafter claiming to be the words of the Buddha. Scholarly Buddhist commentary texts, with named authors, appeared in India, around the 2nd century CE. These texts were written in Pali or Sanskrit, sometimes regional languages, as palm leaf manuscripts, birch bark, painted scrolls, carved into temple walls, and later on paper, unlike what the Bible is to Christianity and the Quran is to Islam, but like all major ancient Indian religions, there is no consensus among the different Buddhist traditions as to what constitutes the scriptures or a common canon in Buddhism. The general belief among Buddhists is that the canonical corpus is vast. This corpus includes the ancient sutras organized into Nikayas, itself the part of three basket of texts called the Tripitakas. Each Buddhist tradition has its own collection of texts, much of which is translation of ancient Pali and Sanskrit Buddhist texts of India. The Chinese Buddhist canon, for example, includes 2,184 texts in 55 volumes, while the Tibetan canon comprises 1108 texts all claim to have been spoken by the Buddha and another 3,461 texts composed by Indian scholars revered in the Tibetan tradition. The Buddhist textual history is vast, over 40,000 manuscripts—mostly Buddhist, some non-Buddhist—were discovered in 1900 in the Dunhuang Chinese cave alone. <laughs> Pali Tipitaka The Pali Tipitaka Sanskrit, Tripitaka, three patakas, which means, three baskets, refers to the Vinaya Pataka, the Sutta Pataka, and the Abhidhamma Pataka. These constitute the oldest known canonical works of Buddhism. The Vinaya Pataka contains disciplinary rules for the Buddhist monasteries. The Sutta Pataka contains words attributed to the Buddha. The Abhidhamma Pataka contain expositions and commentaries on the Sutta, and these vary significantly between Buddhist schools. The Pali Tipitaka is the only surviving early Tipitaka. According to some sources, some early schools of Buddhism had five or seven Pitakas. Much of the material in the canon is not specifically Theravadan, but is instead the collection of teachings that this school preserved from the early, non-sectarian body of teachings. According to Peter Harvey, it contains material at odds with later Theravadan orthodoxy. He states, the Theravadins, then, may have added texts to the canon for some time, but they do not appear to have tampered with what they already had from an earlier period. <laughs> Theravada texts In addition to the Pali canon, the important commentary texts of the Theravada tradition include the 5th century Visuddhimagga by Buddhaghosa of the Mahavihara school. It includes sections on shila virtues, samadhi concentration, panna wisdom, as well as Theravada traditions meditation methodology. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Mahayana Sutras. The Mahayana Sutras are a very broad genre of Buddhist scriptures that the Mahayana Buddhist tradition holds are original teachings of the Buddha. Some adherents of Mahayana accept both the early teachings including in this the Sarvastivada Abhidharma, which was criticized by Nagarjuna and is in fact opposed to early Buddhist thought and the Mahayana Sutras as authentic teachings of Gautama Buddha, and claim they were designed for different types of persons and different levels of spiritual understanding. 
The Mahayana sutras often claim to articulate the Buddha's deeper, more advanced doctrines, reserved for those who follow the bodhisattva path. That path is explained as being built upon the motivation to liberate all living beings from unhappiness. Hence the name Mahayana lit, the, great vehicle. the Theravada school does not treat the Mahayana sutras as authoritative or authentic teachings of the Buddha. Generally, scholars conclude that the Mahayana scriptures were composed from the 1st century CE onwards. Large numbers of Mahayana sutras were being composed in the period between the beginning of the Common Era and the 5th century. Salastamba Sutra Many ancient Indian texts have not survived into the modern era, creating a challenge in establishing the historic commonalities between Theravada and Mahayana. The texts preserved in the Tibetan Buddhist monasteries, with parallel Chinese translations, have provided a breakthrough. Among these is the Mahayana text Salastamba Sutra, which no longer exists in a Sanskrit version, but does in Tibetan and Chinese versions. This Mahayana text contains numerous sections which are remarkably the same as the Theravada Pali Canon and Nikaya Buddhism. The Salastamba Sutra was cited by Mahayana scholars such as the 8th century Yasomitra to be authoritative. This suggests that Buddhist literature of different traditions shared a common core of Buddhist texts in the early centuries of its history, until Mahayana literature diverged about and after the 1st century CE. History Historical roots Historically, the roots of Buddhism lie in the religious thought of Iron Age India around the middle of the first millennium BCE. This was a period of great intellectual ferment and socio-cultural change known as the second urbanization, marked by the composition of the Upanishads and the historical emergence of the Shramanic traditions. New ideas developed both in the Vedic tradition in the form of the Upanishads, and outside of the Vedic tradition through the Sramana movements. The term sramana refers to several Indian religious movements parallel to but separate from the historical Vedic religion, including Buddhism, Jainism and others such as Ahivika. Several sramana movements are known to have existed in India before the 6th century BCE pre-Buddha, pre-Mahavira, and these influenced both the Astika and Nastika traditions of Indian philosophy. According to Martin Wilshire, the Sramana tradition evolved in India over two phases, namely Pachekabuddha and Savaka phases, the former being the tradition of individual ascetic and the latter of disciples, and that Buddhism and Jainism ultimately emerged from these. Brahmanical and non-Brahmanical ascetic groups shared and used several similar ideas, but the Sramana traditions also drew upon already established Brahmanical concepts and philosophical roots, states Wiltshire, to formulate their own doctrines. Brahmanical motifs can be found in the oldest Buddhist texts, using them to introduce and explain Buddhist ideas. For example, prior to Buddhist developments, the Brahmanical tradition internalized and variously reinterpreted the three Vedic sacrificial fires as concepts such as truth, right, tranquility or restraint. Buddhist texts also refer to the three Vedic sacrificial fires, reinterpreting and explaining them as ethical conduct. The Sramana religions challenged and broke with the Brahmanic tradition on core assumptions such as Atman, soul, self, Brahman, the nature of afterlife, and they rejected the authority of the Vedas and Upanishads. Buddhism was one among several Indian religions that did so. Topic: <laughs> Indian Buddhism. The history of Indian Buddhism may be divided into five periods, early Buddhism occasionally called pre-sectarian Buddhism, Nikaya Buddhism or sectarian Buddhism, the period of the early Buddhist schools, early Mahayana Buddhism, later Mahayana Buddhism, and Vajrayana Buddhism. <laughs> pre-sectarian Buddhism According to Lambert Schmidhausen pre-sectarian Buddhism is the canonical period prior to the development of different schools with their different positions. The early Buddhist texts include the four principal Nikayas and their parallel agamas together with the main body of monastic rules, which survive in the various versions of the Padamaka. However, these texts were revised over time, and it is unclear what constitutes the earliest layer of Buddhist teachings. 
One method to obtain information on the oldest core of Buddhism is to compare the oldest extant versions of the Theravadan Pali Canon and other texts. The reliability of the early sources, and the possibility to draw out a core of oldest teachings, is a matter of dispute. According to Vedder, inconsistencies remain, and other methods must be applied to resolve those inconsistencies. According to Schmidhausen, three positions held by scholars of Buddhism can be distinguished. Stress on the fundamental homogeneity and substantial authenticity of at least a considerable part of the Nikayic materials. Skepticism with regard to the possibility of retrieving the doctrine of earliest Buddhism. Cautious optimism in this respect. Topic: <inaudible> Core teachings. According to Mitchell, certain basic teachings appear in many places throughout the early texts, which has led most scholars to conclude that Gautama Buddha must have taught something similar to the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path, Nirvana, the Three Marks of Existence, the Five Aggregates, Dependent Origination, Karma, and Rebirth. Yet critical analysis reveals discrepancies, which point to alternative possibilities. Bruce Matthews notes that there is no cohesive presentation of karma in the Sutta Pitaka, which may mean that the doctrine was incidental to the main perspective of early Buddhist soteriology. Schmidhausen has questioned whether karma already played a role in the theory of rebirth of earliest Buddhism. According to Vedder, the Buddha at first sought the deathless, Amata, Amrta, which is concerned with the here and now. Only later did he become acquainted with the doctrine of rebirth. Bronckhorst disagrees, and concludes that the Buddha introduced a concept of karma that differed considerably from the commonly held views of his time. According to Bronckhorst, not physical and mental activities as such were seen as responsible for rebirth, but intentions and desire. Another core problem in the study of early Buddhism is the relation between dhyana and insight. Schmidhausen states that the Four Noble Truths is liberating insight may be a later addition to texts such as Majjhima Nikaya 36 according to both Bronckhorst and Anderson the four noble truths became a substitution for prajna or liberating insight in the suttas in those texts where liberating insight was preceded by the four jhanas the four truths may not have been formulated in earliest buddhism and did not serve in earliest buddhism as a description of liberating insight katama's teachings may have been personal adjusted to the need of each person. The three marks of existence, dukkha, anicca, and nada, may reflect Upanishadic or other influences. K. R. Norman supposes that these terms were already in use at the Buddha's time, and were familiar to his hearers. According to Vedder, the description of the Buddhist path may initially have been as simple as the term, the middle way. In time, this short description was elaborated, resulting in the description of the Eightfold Path. Similarly nibbana is the common term for the desired goal of this practice, yet many other terms can be found throughout the Nikayas, which are not specified. <laughs> Early Buddhist schools According to the scriptures, soon after the Parinirvana from Sanskrit, highest extinguishment of Gautama Buddha, the first Buddhist council was held. As with any ancient Indian tradition, transmission of teaching was done orally. The primary purpose of the assembly was to collectively recite the teachings to ensure that no errors occurred in oral transmission. Richard Gombrich states that the monastic assembly recitations of the Buddha's teaching likely began during Buddha's lifetime, similar to the first council, that helped compose Buddhist scriptures. The second Buddhist council resulted in the first schism in the Sangha, probably caused by a group of reformists called Staviras who split from the conservative majority Mahasamgikas. After unsuccessfully trying to modify the Vinaya, a small group of elderly members i.e. Staviras, broke away from the majority Mahasamgika during the Second Buddhist Council, giving rise to the Stavira Nikaya. The Staviras gave rise to several schools, one of which was the Theravada school. Originally, these schisms were caused by disputes over monastic disciplinary codes of various fraternities, but eventually, by about 100 CE if not earlier, schisms were being caused by doctrinal disagreements too. Buddhist monks of different fraternities became distinct schools and stopped doing official Sangha business together, but continued to study each other's doctrines. Following or leading up to the schisms, each Sangha started to accumulate their own version of Tripitaka, Pali canons, triple basket of texts. 
In their Tripitaka, each school included the suttas of the Buddha, a Vinaya basket disciplinary code and added an Abhidharma basket which were texts on detailed scholastic classification, summary and interpretation of the suttas. The doctrine details in the Abhidharmas of various Buddhist schools differ significantly, and these were composed starting about the 3rd century BCE and through the 1st millennium CE. Eighteen early Buddhist schools are known, each with its own Tripitaka, but only one collection from Sri Lanka has survived, in a nearly complete state, into the modern era. <laughs> early Mahayana Buddhism Several scholars have suggested that the Mahayana Buddhist tradition started in South India modern Andhra Pradesh, and it is there that Prajnaparamita Sutras, among the earliest Mahayana Sutras, developed among the Mahasamgika along the Kursna River region about the 1st century BCE. There is no evidence that Mahayana ever referred to a separate formal school or sect of Buddhism, but rather that it existed as a certain set of ideals, and later doctrines, for bodhisattvas. Initially it was known as Bodhisattvayana the vehicle of the bodhisattvas." Paul Williams states that the Mahayana never had nor ever attempted to have a separate Vinaya or ordination codes from the early schools of Buddhism. Records written by Chinese monks visiting India indicate that both Mahayana and non-Mahayana monks could be found in the same monasteries, with the difference that Mahayana monks worshipped figures of bodhisattvas, while non-Mahayana monks did not. Much of the early extant evidence for the origins of Mahayana comes from early Chinese translations of Mahayana texts. These Mahayana teachings were first propagated into China by Lokaksima, the first translator of Mahayana sutras into Chinese during the 2nd century CE. Some scholars have traditionally considered the earliest Mahayana sutras to include the very first versions of the Prajnaparamita series, along with texts concerning Aksobhya, which were probably composed in the 1st century BCE in the south of India. <laughs> Late Mahayana Buddhism During the period of late Mahayana, four major types of thought developed, Madhyamaka, Yogacara, Tathagatagarbha, and Buddhist logic as the last and most recent. In India, the two main philosophical schools of the Mahayana were the Madhyamaka and the later Yogacara. According to Dan Lusthaus, Madhyamaka and Yogacara have a great deal in common, and the commonality stems from early Buddhism. There were no great Indian teachers associated with Tathagatagarbha thought. Vajrayana esoteric Buddhism. Scholarly research concerning esoteric Buddhism is still in its early stages and has a number of problems that make research difficult. Vajrayana Buddhism was influenced by Hinduism, and therefore research must include exploring Hinduism as well. The scriptures of Vajrayana have not yet been put in any kind of order. Ritual must be examined as well, not just doctrine. Topic. Spread of Buddhism Buddhism may have spread only slowly in India until the time of the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka, who was a public supporter of the religion. The support of Ashoka and his descendants led to the construction of more stupas Buddhist religious memorials and to its spread throughout the Maurya Empire and into neighbouring lands such as Central Asia and to the island of Sri Lanka. These two missions, in opposite directions, would ultimately lead, in the first case to the spread of Buddhism into China, Korea and Japan, and in the second case, to the emergence of Sinhalese Theravada Buddhism and its spread from Sri Lanka to much of Southeast Asia. This period marks the first known spread of Buddhism beyond India. According to the Edicts of Asoka, emissaries were sent to various countries west of India to spread Buddhism dharma, particularly in eastern provinces of the neighbouring Seleucid Empire, and even farther to Hellenistic kingdoms of the Mediterranean. It is a matter of disagreement among scholars whether or not these emissaries were accompanied by Buddhist missionaries. In Central and West Asia, Buddhist influence grew, through Greek-speaking Buddhist monarchs and ancient Asian trade routes. An example of this is evidenced in Chinese and Pali Buddhist records, such as Melindapanna and the Greco-Buddhist art of Gandhara. The Melindapanna describes a conversation between a Buddhist monk and the 2nd century BCE Greek king Menander, after which Menander abdicates and himself goes into monastic life in the pursuit of nirvana. 
Some scholars have questioned the Melindapana version, expressing doubts whether Menander was Buddhist or just favorably disposed to Buddhist monks. The Kushans mid -first -third century CE came to control the Silk Road trade through Central and South Asia, which brought them to interact with ancient Buddhist monasteries and societies involved in trade in these regions. They patronized Buddhist institutions, and Buddhist monastery influence, in turn, expanded into a world religion, according to Xinru Lu. Buddhism spread to Khotan and China, eventually to other parts of the Far East. Some of the earliest written documents of the Buddhist faith are the Gandharan Buddhist texts, dating from about the 1st century CE, and connected to the Dharmaguptaka school. These texts are written in the Kharisthi script, a script that was predominantly used in the Greco-Bactrian and Indo-Greek kingdoms of northern India and that played a prominent role in the coinage and inscriptions of their kings. The Islamic conquest of the Iranian plateau in the 7th century, followed by the Muslim conquests of Afghanistan and the later establishment of the Ghaznavid kingdom with Islam as the state religion in Central Asia between the 10th and 12th century led to the decline and disappearance of Buddhism from most of these regions. To East and Southeast Asia The Silk Road transmission of Buddhism to China is most commonly thought to have started in the late 2nd or the 1st century CE, though the literary sources are all open to question. The first documented translation efforts by foreign Buddhist monks in China were in the 2nd century CE, probably as a consequence of the expansion of the Kushan Empire into the Chinese territory of the Tarim Basin. The first documented Buddhist texts translated into Chinese are those of the Parthian and Shigao, 148 to 180 CE. The first known Mahayana scriptural texts are translations into Chinese by the Kushan monk Lokaksima in Luoyang, between 178 and 189 CE. From China, Buddhism was introduced into its neighbors Korea 4th century, Japan 6th 7th centuries, and Vietnam c. 1st 2nd centuries during the Chinese Tang dynasty 618 to 907. Chinese esoteric Buddhism was introduced from India and Chan Buddhism Zen became a major religion. Chan continued to grow in the Song dynasty and it was during this era that it strongly influenced Korean Buddhism and Japanese Buddhism. Pure Land Buddhism also became popular during this period and was often practiced together with Chan. It was also during the Song that the entire Chinese canon was printed using over 130,000 wooden printing blocks. During the Indian period of esoteric Buddhism from the 8th century onwards, Buddhism spread from India to Tibet and Mongolia. Johannes Bronckhorst states that the esoteric form was attractive because it allowed both a secluded monastic community as well as the social rites and rituals important to laypersons and to kings for the maintenance of a political state during succession and wars to resist invasion. During the Middle Ages, Buddhism slowly declined in India, while it vanished from Persia and Central Asia as Islam became the state religion. The Theravada school arrived in Sri Lanka sometime in the 3rd century BCE. Sri Lanka became a base for its later spread to Southeast Asia after the 5th century CE Myanmar, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia and coastal Vietnam. Theravada Buddhism was the dominant religion in Burma during the Mon Hanthawadi Kingdom 1287-1552. It also became dominant in the Khmer Empire during the 13th and 14th centuries and in the Thai Sukhothai Kingdom during the reign of Ram Khamhaeng 1237-1247-1298. Schools and traditions Buddhists generally classify themselves as either Theravada or Mahayana. This classification is also used by some scholars and is the one ordinarily used in the English language. An alternative scheme used by some scholars divides Buddhism into the following three traditions or geographical or cultural areas, Theravada, East Asian Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism. Some scholars use other schemes. Buddhists themselves have a variety of other schemes. Hinayana literally, lesser or inferior vehicle, is used by Mahayana followers to name the family of early philosophical schools and traditions from which contemporary Theravada emerged, but as the Hinayana term is considered derogatory, a variety of other terms are used instead, including Sravakayana, Nikaya Buddhism, early Buddhist schools, sectarian Buddhism and conservative Buddhism. Not all traditions of Buddhism share the same philosophical outlook, or treat the same concepts as central. 
Each tradition, however, does have its own core concepts, and some comparisons can be drawn between them. Both Theravada and Mahayana traditions accept the Buddha as the founder, Theravada considers him unique, but Mahayana considers him one of many Buddhas. Both accept the middle way, dependent origination, the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path and the Three Marks of Existence. Nirvana is attainable by the monks in Theravada tradition, while Mahayana considers it broadly attainable, Arhat state is aimed for in the Theravada, while Buddhahood is aimed for in the Mahayana. Religious practice consists of meditation for monks and prayer for laypersons in Theravada, while Mahayana includes prayer, chanting and meditation for both. Theravada has been a more rationalist, historical form of Buddhism, while Mahayana has included more rituals, mysticism and worldly flexibility in its scope. Timeline This is a rough timeline of the development of the different schools, traditions. Theravada school The Theravada tradition traces its roots to the words of the Buddha preserved in the Pali Canon, and considers itself to be the more orthodox form of Buddhism. Theravada flourished in South India and Sri Lanka in ancient times, from there it spread for the first time into mainland Southeast Asia about the 11th century into its elite urban centers. By the 13th century, Theravada had spread widely into the rural areas of mainland Southeast Asia, displacing Mahayana Buddhism and some traditions of Hinduism which had arrived in places such as Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Indonesia and Malaysia around the mid-first millennium CE. The later traditions were well established in South Thailand and Java by the 7th century, under the sponsorship of the Srivijaya dynasty. The political separation between Khmer and Sukhothai led the Sukhothai king to welcome Sri Lankan emissaries, helping them establish the first Theravada Buddhist Sangha in the 13th century. In contrast to the Mahayana tradition of Khmer earlier, Sinhalese Buddhist reformers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries portrayed the Pali Canon as the original version of scripture. They also emphasized Theravada being rational and scientific. Theravada is primarily practiced today in Sri Lanka, Burma, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, as well as small portions of China, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Bangladesh. It has a growing presence in the West. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Mahayana traditions. Mahayana schools consider the Mahayana sutras as authoritative scriptures and accurate rendering of Buddha's words. These traditions have been the more liberal form of Buddhism, allowing different and new interpretations that emerged over time. Mahayana flourished in India from the time of Ashoka through to the dynasty of the Guptas, 4th to 6th century. Mahayana monastic foundations and centers of learning were established by the Buddhist kings, and the Hindu kings of the Gupta dynasty as evidenced by records left by three Chinese visitors to India. The Gupta dynasty, for example, helped establish the famed Nalanda University in Bihar. These monasteries and foundations helped Buddhist scholarship, as well as studies into non-Buddhist traditions and secular subjects such as medicine, host visitors and spread Buddhism into East and Central Asia. Native Mahayana Buddhism is practiced today in China, Japan, Korea, Singapore, parts of Russia and most of Vietnam also commonly referred to as Eastern Buddhism. The Buddhism practiced in Tibet, the Himalayan regions, and Mongolia is also Mahayana in origin, but is discussed below under the heading of Vajrayana also commonly referred to as Northern Buddhism. There are a variety of strands in Eastern Buddhism, of which the Pure Land School of Mahayana is the most widely practiced today. In most of this area however, they are fused into a single unified form of Buddhism. In Japan in particular, they form separate denominations with the five major ones being, Nichiren, peculiar to Japan, Pure Land, Shingon, a form of Vajrayana, Tendai, and Zen. In Korea, nearly all Buddhists belong to the Chogi school, which is officially Sun Zen, but with substantial elements from other traditions. <laughs> Vajrayana traditions The goal and philosophy of the Vajrayana remains Mahayanist, but its methods are seen by its followers as far more powerful, so as to lead to Buddhahood in just one lifetime. 
The practice of using mantras was adopted from Hinduism, where they were first used in the Vedas. Various classes of Vajrayana literature developed as a result of royal courts sponsoring both Buddhism and Savism. The Manjusramalakalpa, which later came to classified under Kriya Tantra, states that mantras taught in the Saiva, Garuda, and Vaisnava Tantras will be effective if applied by Buddhists since they were all taught originally by Manjushri. The Guyasiddhi of Padmavajra, a work associated with the Guyasamaja tradition, prescribes acting as a Seva guru and initiating members into Seva Siddhanta scriptures and mandalas. The Samvara Tantra texts adopted the Pitha list from the Seva text Tantrasadbhava, introducing a copying error where a deity was mistaken for a place. Tibetan Buddhism preserves the Vajrayana teachings of 8th century India. Tantric Buddhism is largely concerned with ritual and meditative practices. A central feature of Buddhist Tantra is deity yoga which includes visualization and identification with an enlightened yidam or meditation deity and its associated mandala. Another element of Tantra is the need for ritual initiation or empowerment by a guru or lama. Some tantras like the Guhyasamaja Tantra features new forms of antinomian ritual practice such as the use taboo substances like alcohol, sexual yoga, and charnel ground practices which evoke wrathful deities. Zen Zen Buddhism, Chan pronounced Chan in Chinese, Son in Korean or Zen in Japanese derived from the Sanskrit term dhyana, meaning meditation, is a form of Mahayana Buddhism found in China, Korea and Japan. It lays special emphasis on meditation, and direct discovery of the Buddha nature. Zen Buddhism is divided into two main schools, Rinzai Lin Ji Zong and Soto, Sao Dong Zong the former greatly favoring the use in meditation on the koan, gongan a meditative riddle or puzzle as a device for spiritual breakthrough, and the latter while certainly employing koans focusing more on shikantaza or just sitting. Zen Buddhism is primarily found in Japan, with some presence in South Korea and Vietnam. The scholars of Japanese Soto Zen tradition in recent times have critiqued the mainstream Japanese Buddhism for Datu Vada, that is assuming things have substantiality, a view they assert to be non-Buddhist and out of tune with the teachings of non-self and conditioned arising, states Peter Harvey. <laughs> Buddhism in the modern era Topic. Colonial era Buddhism has faced various challenges and changes during the colonization of Buddhist states by Christian countries and its persecution under modern states. Like other religions, the findings of modern science has challenged its basic premises. One response to some of these challenges has come to be called Buddhist modernism. Early Buddhist modernist figures such as the American convert Henry Alcott (1832–1907) and Anagarika Dharmapala (1864–1933) reinterpreted and promoted Buddhism as a scientific and rational religion, which they saw as compatible with modern science. East Asian Buddhism, meanwhile, suffered under various wars which ravaged China during the modern era, such as the Taiping Rebellion and the Second World War, which also affected Korean Buddhism. During the Republican period 1912 a new movement called Humanistic Buddhism was developed by figures such as Taishu and though Buddhist institutions were destroyed during the Cultural Revolution 1966 there has been a revival of the religion in China after 1977. Japanese Buddhism also went through a period of modernization during the Meiji era. In Central Asia meanwhile, the arrival of communist repression to Tibet 1966 to 1980 and Mongolia between 1924 to 1990 had a strong negative impact on Buddhist institutions, though the situation has improved somewhat since the 80s and 90s. Topic: <laughs> Modern era. Buddhism in the West. While there were some encounters of Western travelers or missionaries such as St. Francis Javier and Ippolito Desideri with Buddhist cultures, it was not until the 19th century that Buddhism began to be studied by Western scholars. It was the work of pioneering scholars such as Eugene Bernouffe, Max Muller, Hermann Oldenburg and Thomas William Rhys Davids that paved the way for modern Buddhist studies in the West. The English words such as Buddhism, Buddhist, Buddhist, 
and Buddhist were coined in the early 19th century in the West, while in 1881, Rhys Davids founded the Pali Text Society, an influential Western resource of Buddhist literature in the Pali language and one of the earliest publisher of a journal on Buddhist studies. It was also during the 19th century that Asian Buddhist immigrants mainly from China and Japan began to arrive in Western countries such as the United States and Canada, bringing with them their Buddhist religion. This period also saw the first Westerners to formally convert to Buddhism, such as Helena Blavatsky and Henry Steele Alcott. An important event in the introduction of Buddhism to the West was the 1893 World Parliament of Religions, which for the first time saw well-publicized speeches by major Buddhist leaders alongside other religious leaders. The 20th century saw a prolific growth of new Buddhist institutions in Western countries, including the Buddhist Society, London 1924, Das Buddhistische Haus 1924, and Datsun Gunzeshwane in St. Petersburg. The publication and translations of Buddhist literature in Western languages thereafter accelerated. After the Second World War, further immigration from Asia, globalization, the secularization on Western culture as well a renewed interest in Buddhism among the 60s counterculture led to further growth in Buddhist institutions. Influential figures on post-war Western Buddhism include Shunryu Suzuki, Jack Kerouac, Alan Watts, Thich Nhat Hanh, and the 14th Dalai Lama. While Buddhist institutions have grown, some of the central premises of Buddhism such as the cycles of rebirth and Four Noble Truths have been problematic in the West. In contrast, states Christopher Gowans, for most ordinary Asian Buddhists, today as well as in the past, their basic moral orientation is governed by belief in karma and rebirth. Most Asian Buddhist laypersons, states Kevin Trainer, have historically pursued Buddhist rituals and practices seeking better rebirth, not nirvana or freedom from rebirth. Buddhism has spread across the world, and Buddhist texts are increasingly translated into local languages. While Buddhism in the West is often seen as exotic and progressive, in the East it is regarded as familiar and traditional. In countries such as Cambodia and Bhutan, it is recognized as the state religion and receives government support. In certain regions such as Afghanistan and Pakistan, militants have targeted violence and destruction of historic Buddhist monuments. Neo-Buddhism movements A number of modern movements in Buddhism emerged during the second half of the 20th century. These new forms of Buddhism are diverse and significantly depart from traditional beliefs and practices. In India, B.R. Ambedkar launched the Navayana tradition, literally, new vehicle. Ambedkar's Buddhism rejects the foundational doctrines and historic practices of traditional Theravada and Mahayana traditions, such as monk lifestyle after renunciation, karma, rebirth, samsara, meditation, nirvana, four noble truths, and others. Ambedkar's Navayana Buddhism considers these as superstitions and reinterprets the original Buddha as someone who taught about class struggle and social equality. Ambedkar urged low caste Indian Dalits to convert to his Marxism inspired reinterpretation called the Navayana Buddhism, also known as Bhimayana Buddhism. Ambedkar's effort led to the expansion of Navayana Buddhism in India. The Thai king Mongkut, R. 1851 68, and his son King Chulalongkorn, R. 1868 1910, were responsible for modern reforms of Thai Buddhism. Modern Buddhist movements include secular Buddhism in many countries, one Buddhism in Korea, the Dhammakaya movement in Thailand, and several Japanese organizations, such as Shinyo en, Risho Kosei Kai, or Soka Gakkai. Some of these movements have brought internal disputes and strife within regional Buddhist communities. For example, the Dhammakaya movement in Thailand teaches a true self doctrine, which traditional Theravada monks consider as heretically denying the fundamental anatta not self doctrine of Buddhism. Demographics <inaudible> 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 Buddhism is practiced by an estimated 488 million, 495 million, or 535 million people as of the 2010s, representing 7% to 8% of the world's total population. China is the country with the largest population of Buddhists, approximately 244 million or 18.2% of its total population. They are mostly followers of Chinese schools of Mahayana, making this the largest body of Buddhist traditions. 
Mahayana, also practiced in broader East Asia, is followed by over half of world Buddhists. According to a demographic analysis reported by Peter Harvey, 2013, Mahayana has 360 million adherents, Theravada has 150 million adherents, and Vajrayana has 18.2 million adherents. According to Johnson and Grimm 2013, Buddhism has grown from a total of 138 million adherents in 1910, of which 137 million were in Asia, to 495 million in 2010, of which 487 million are in Asia. Over 98% of all Buddhists live in the Asia-Pacific and South Asia region. North America had about 3.9 million Buddhists, Europe 1.3 million, while South America, Africa and the Middle East had an estimated combined total of about 1 million Buddhists in 2010. Buddhism is the dominant religion in Bhutan, Burma, Cambodia, Tibet, Laos, Mongolia, Sri Lanka and Thailand. Large Buddhist populations live in China 18%, Japan 36%, Taiwan 35%, Macau 17%, North Korea 14%, Nepal 11%, Vietnam 10%, Singapore 33%, Hong Kong 15% and South Korea 23%. Buddhism is also growing by conversion in United States. Only about a third 32% of Buddhists in the United States are Asian. A majority 53% are white. Buddhism in the America is primarily made up of native-born adherents, whites and converts. After China, where nearly half of the worldwide Buddhists live, the ten countries with the largest Buddhist population densities are. See also Notes Subnotes <laughs>